Welcome everyone to our panel today. We're honored to have two very qualified students sharing their precious experience and applying to University of Pennsylvania Wharton Business School. Wharton is one of the number one business school from the US News and World Report in year 2023. After the panelists share their experiences, we'll have a Q&A section. So if you have any questions, feel free to type them in the chat and I will compile the questions for our panelists. 大家下午好,谢谢大家在百忙中抽空来参加今日的讲座。我们很荣幸能请到两位优秀学生为我们分享他们申请大学的宝贵经验。相信您不会对今天的讲座失望的。Today, we also have a sub special surprise for all who stay for the whole panel discussion. At the end of the session, we will have a drawing for a voucher to our virtual HSK camp. So this voucher is transferable. So what a pleasure it is to have Mandy Guo and Annabella Farrell for here today. So, uh, today we will ask Right now, we have a little uh, poll for your language preference. So we would like for you to answer, if you don't mind, answer our questions. Um, so for the language, your preferred language for our panelists. Without further ado, while I keep the um, poll on for a couple more minutes, I will actually have give um, the rest of our time to our panelists. So let us welcome Anna, Annabelle Ferro and Mandy Guo. Now we are really excited to welcome Fu Anna and Gao Mingyu. Just give the time to them two. Hello, everyone. My name is Mandy Guo, and I'm a high school senior who lives in St. Augustine, Florida. And I was accepted into the Warren School of Business at the University of Pennsylvania, which is one of the eight Ivy League schools in America. My parents are both Chinese immigrants, but I was born in the US and English was my first language. In first grade, my parents sent me to study abroad in China. And ever since then, I have continued to learn and improve my Chinese, the process of which I enjoy immensely. Through Chinese, I am also able to learn more about my Chinese heritage and culture. I hope that through studying Chinese in college, I can, I can conduct business in China and improve relationships between the two most influential countries in the world. Annabelle, you're muted. Sorry. <laughs> Um, hi, everyone. My name is Annabelle Fro, and I just graduated from Suncoast Community High School um, in Palm Beach, Florida, and I was also admitted to UPenn to study international business, and specifically, I uh, plan to study Chinese in college and uh, further research on how China plays a big part in the world's economy, and I've been studying Chinese since I was five years old, and I love learning about Chinese culture and really want to take it to the next level and implement it in my career. Um, so we will begin today's presentation by like talking about the different components of a uh, college application process. And um, the first thing that we have is important college application deadlines. These are when you have to turn in your college application so the first option you have is early decision. 
um, which is uh, ED in short, usually in November, um, students who apply via early decision or ED, they hear back from colleges sooner than their peers who turn in applications later. ED admissions decisions often come out by December. However, students should be aware that ED acceptances are binding, meaning an applicant must enroll if offered admission. Um, another thing about early decision um, deadline is that it can improve your chances of getting into a particular school. For example, if you're applying to a more prestigious college and you um, turn in your application through early decision, um, then you might have a greater chance of getting into that school because um, you are binded to that school if they accept you. And the second option is early action, which is um, also that you turn it in in December or November. And very similar to early decision, students who apply via early action will hear back from school sooner. The difference is that early action is not binding. And then the third option that you have is regular decision, RD for short. And this is the most common time that people turn in their application, which is around um, it can be as early as November 30th, or it can be around January 1st to February. Um, students who apply regular decision will hear back from their schools in mid to late March or early April. And the fourth one is rolling decision. Some schools have it where they continue accepting students until all their spots are filled. Um, do you have anything to add, Annabelle? No, I think you covered everything. Okay, so the next part of the application process is choosing which platform you're going to use. Most students typically go with using Common App because it's the most common, but um, Common App supports over 900 colleges, so you can apply uh, to all of these different schools given that they use the system. But the limit to the number of schools you can apply to on Common App is 20. So just make sure that you do your research and um, see which schools accept Common App and which schools don't. Typically, most schools that you're going to be applying to will accept it. Um, there's also separate application portals such as the MIT portal and Georgetown. Those are like the biggest um, known ones, but also like the UC schools use a separate application portal. So just make sure to do your research here because you won't find them on the common app and then coalition application. This is less common, but still it's good if you wanna um, go and apply to more than 20 schools. So schools don't usually have a preference of which one you use. Again, just make sure that it's supported by them. Um, yeah, do you have anything to add, Mandy? Uh, I think we're good on that. Okay, okay and then now we're gonna go into the actual um, parts of your college application. Um, the first component is the essays. Um, by the way, this is in no particular order. This is just listing out the different components. So essays, there are um, typically two general types of essays. There's the personal essay, which is the main essay that you write for common application. Um, it's around 560 word, no, 650 words. And um, prompts vary slightly from year to year, but generally they ask students to tell a story about themselves, um, a challenge that they had to overcome. Um, it's very broad and you can pretty much write about anything. Um, one thing to note about personal essays is do not focus too much on other people. Um, try to make it more about you. So don't write a whole essay about how your mother was such a great entrepreneur or she won awards or something like that. You can mention people who inspired you, but do not make the essay all about them because this essay is very important. Um, the second general type of essay that you would be asked to write your, in your college application process is supplemental essays. So they could ask anything from why did you choose this school? Why did you develop an interest in this um, field of study? Um, or if you're applying to a specific program um, within the school, they'll ask you your, in your interest in that specific program. But not every school requires them, but if they do have them as an option, it's best to do them. Because through these essays is 
a lot of time how people stand out in their college application process. You have standardized tests, you have GPA and all that, but your essays really bring out the human quality um, of your application. Do you have anything to add, Annabelle? Yeah, I just want to clarify the personal statement. It goes to all of the schools on Common App. So every school is going to get a copy of this essay, but the supplemental essays are like the ones that are specific to one school versus the, another. So that's just like, the distinguishing factor um, about that. So, yeah. Oh, another thing that I want to add is like, just give an example, like UPenn, um, they had us ha turn in the um, personal essay on common, on common application. And they also had us turn in um, a YU pen type of essay and another uh, supplemental essay that asks like, what are some extracurriculars that you would like to join or like something outside of academic that you would like to pr pursue. And they also, cause I also applied to the Huntsman program which is a dual degree program that is um, a degree in international studies and business. So they would ask you why you would want to apply to this specific program. Yeah, and make sure that for the essays you do your research, like most colleges or I, I would say around like half of them will have like a why, like why this college essay. And you don't want it to sound generic, like you copy and pasted it from one like essay to another. It's okay if there's similar prompts in like different areas to copy some parts of it. But generally you should be like watching videos or doing your research and like finding specific traditions or something that you want to write about or certain clubs and like very specific, like name out certain things that are very unique to the college. So, cause college admissions officers can tell cause you're going to have a lot of essays to write. So they want to know that you're actually spending time to do your research and you know what you're like going for in college. Yeah, I definitely agree because if you don't do a lot of research and you just kind of do like a copy and paste kind of format essay, Colleges can tell that you're not really passionate about their school and it makes your um, application in general more weaker. Right. All right. Um, okay. Stats. So, yeah. So, stats. So, colleges, uh, one of the parts of the college application process is when the admissions officers are reviewing your stats, they'll look for certain things. So, SAT and ACT, not the biggest factor in the upcoming years. Like since COVID, they've gotten, most colleges have gotten rid of the requirement, but I still recommend taking it anyways, especially like if you study for it, because it can help your application if you submit it, but it is totally not against you if you don't submit a score or not. So if you think that the certain score is like above the average or something that would help you, I would recommend um, submitting your score. And then your GPA. So colleges do want to see an upward trend. If you started off not that strong freshman year, it's okay. Just make sure that you are going upwards and just trying to challenge yourself and like study your hardest. And at the end of the day, like the GPA, it's not like the biggest factor, like what you have to say about yourself and like your extracurriculars speak more than um, like your score, I think. And then the rigor. So I also wouldn't worry too much about if your school offers AP classes or IP cl IB classes, if, or if they offer like dual enrollment or not, colleges get um, the outline, they get like the whole scope of what classes your school offers or not. So if they see that your school hasn't offered a lot of AP classes, but you're still like taking the max coursework or, or you're challenging yourself with the like the densest coursework that you can at the school, they're going to be just as impressed as if you were taking like all AP classes. So don't worry about that. And also I would take classes that you're genuinely, genuinely interested in. So I wouldn't really suggest for um, like something way out there ter in terms of classes. So you should have like a good background in like physics or math if you want to be like an engineering major. And then of course, you're gonna to have to send a copy of your transcripts to your college. So first it's generally the guidance counselor on Common App it is, that sends your application, your transcripts to the colleges through Common App. So they all get the same copy of it. And then towards the end, like once you been accepted or even like sometimes before that, you just have to check your like status portal, which you'll get after you like send it on Common App, they'll give you like a application status portal, make sure to check that because it'll have 
both financial aid information and if they want a mid-year transcript report, which is like your first semester grades, then it's best to send those to them. But then again, you can also have your guidance counselor do that. Um, anything else? Um, also, again, I kind of want to like give examples about choosing classes to take. Like you said, um, it's best to take classes that you think will be helpful towards your um, intended major or your field of study, whatever. For example, um, when I applied to um, uh, UPenn for their business school, I also had that I took um, macro and micro classes and also math is very important for business. So I took stats, um, AP stats and I took AP Calc BC. Um, and also I took um, uh, IB higher level math. So all that like also plays into like whether or not you can get into that particular school or program. Oh, I was just gonna add one more thing. Also, uh, like back to like, oh, freshman year, you didn't do well in a class. I wouldn't worry too much about it because if you have like an extenuating circumstance, there's a place on Common App that you can like type up a reason or like why you didn't do as well in a class as you should have. So it's honestly not that big of a deal in the long run. And colleges just want to make sure that like, you know, you're giving it your best and you're still trying like despite all these other things that are going on in your life. So they understand that. 呃，还有，要是有什么人需要用中文来解释这些东西的话，在弹幕里面可以跟我们说，然后我们可以用中文来解释。Okay, so the next component is recommendations. Um, recommendations. Students should seek out these recommenders. Um, often they are teachers, your coach, maybe even employers, or anyone who knows you well enough and can comment. Not just on your academic abilities, but also your personal qualities, like what kind of student you are, what kind of person you are, um, and other achievements that you have um, made throughout high school. So it's also a good idea for students per, to provide your recommenders with a copy of a, like a general resume to help um, your recommender cover all of these different things that you would like your colleges to know about you. Um, for example, whenever I asked my math teacher to write me a recommendation letter for UPenn, I gave her a resume of, I actually showed her my personal essay, um, which I think shows a lot about my um, character. And also I told her like different quality traits that I would use to describe myself and um, like different extracurricular activities that I do around school and stuff like that. So something like this would help your recommender to write a more detailed and well-rounded um, letter of recommendation for your school. And just make sure to choose a recommender who knows you well enough, who could actually provide enough material for this letter. Um, students should request letters of recommendation well before the application deadline, at least two months in advance. So it's best to start um, finding your recommenders and getting this recommendation letter done beforehand because um, in the beginning of the school year and stuff, things, you're gonna be busy, um, you're gonna have extra curriculars to do. And a lot of times teachers have their own life as well. So it's best to do it beforehand and well before the application deadline, just so nothing um, happens and you can get it, yeah, turn it in time. Um, I just want to highlight that recommenders typically can only be from like your core classes. So um, there's usually two and they'll colleges will usually ask for like somebody that's an, either an English teacher, a history teacher, a math teacher, or um, a science teacher. So make sure that you're building up good relationships starting now with them and choose one that you've known for quite a bit of time and that knows a lot about you personally. So if you didn't really speak up a lot in a class, then maybe that's not like the best person to choose. Just make sure that they can like give a holistic um, idea. And there's also additional recommenders that some schools let you submit. So they can be like a coach, a mentor, a friend, another teacher. So I would also take advantage of that because it, it also gives you like more supporting statements for your application, which is like always a good thing. Read next. Okay, so extracurriculars. I think that this is probably one of the biggest parts of your application, um, it, as in it's like 
really unique to you. So you should show leadership in these roles. And in Common App, there's only room for 10 uh, extracurricular activities that you can add in. So uh, before you apply, like start thinking about which clubs you want to drop to give more attention to the ones that you're really passionate about or that actually like make sense for your application and actually like towards your career. So they shouldn't be clubs that you're in just to like, you know, be in them, be really passionate and go like deep in the clubs that you're in. So maybe like, you know, leadership role or start like a community project. And um, so you can also talk about these, of course, in your application, in like your supplemental essays, or even in your personal statement, if they are really meaningful to you, but your extracurricular activities can be anywhere from internships, research, research, student government, clubs at school, honestly, anything that you do outside of the classroom is something that you can add onto your extracurricular um, list. And it will also ask you like for the duration of time you do it, like how often you do it per week, how many hours, what your role is. So it's like all of these little things and also like a brief description. So you wanna make sure that you're giving like most of your effort to these areas. And also if you want more of an explanation, then go ahead and talk about how you've been impacted by these different clubs and how like they've changed you as a person. And also it would be a good idea to do some research to see if there's similar clubs at the college that you want to attend to. So if you're really interested in like something like Model UN, then maybe look into see if the college has a club like Model UN. So you can talk about how you're really excited to join this club because you've been part of it for like two years in high school and you want to continue. So I think that would be a great way to show both engagement and research. Um, another thing, like this is something that I, I mean, she talked about it. There's only 10 spaces on your common app for extracurriculars. And this includes like work, um, sports, um, clubs, internships, etc. And I wish I knew in freshman year that you don't have to do so many clubs and like there's only 10 spaces because I didn't even have enough space to include things like track or um, uh, National Honor Society. I did not have enough space. So I wish someone in freshman year or like earlier told me that there's only 10 spaces, but just de really dedicate your time to those clubs that you're passionate about and this will be sufficient. All right, so the f uh, fifth component about for your account your application process is the interviews, which are oftentimes they're optional and usually only prestigious um, universities um, will offer you these interviews. For example, UPenn, um, they had interviews for, they try to do all applicants to um, UPenn. So I also had an interview for UPenn and um, uh, if they do offer um, these interviews, it's best to um, try them out because they go in as a check mark on your application. Um, and they can help your application, but they, they don't really have the power to break your application. So don't worry too much. Don't be too nervous. Uh, most of the time, the alumni just wants to have a chat or a conversation with you and just give the college more idea of what kind of student or person you are. Um, also, in order to prepare for the interview, you can look up like commonly asked questions or different videos about preparing for a specific school's interview or um, just an interview in general. Yeah, and prepare for them to be on Zoom too, because most uh, most of the time you're not going to have an interviewer in your area and also with COVID that is going to be available. So they're usually online unless like you're probably like in the top like the 10 percent of applicants that have somebody in your area it's just good to know the format that you're going to be in and yeah just don't be nervous they honestly just want to have a conversation with you so. okay um, and Chinese education so that was really a unique part I think about me and Mandy's um, application and both in different ways so Mandy's a native speaker and I'm not a native speaker so our like experiences are completely different. So it doesn't just have to be with Chinese. It can honestly be with any language or anything that really sets you apart from other people. So build up your portfolio. So since I was interested in Chinese, I went out and I saw a lot of opportunities, like different classes to take, different like job opportunities to um, show that I was like interested in Chinese culture. 
and like show a passion for it. And even in my application, I started talking about how I wanted to pursue it in the future and at college, like taking classes and doing international business. I think that was a big part that really shows that my interest was, you know, for the long run and make it personal too. I think that a great thing to include in your essays would be how different experiences have changed you. It really shows global mindedness, global mindedness, like study abroad trips or classes or like mentors, teachers, or friends who have shared stories with you or have changed the way that you look at Chinese culture or another culture. That's a great way to show that, you know, you're like a world thinker and you're trying to become more global so it's learning that happens outside of the classroom that really counts in the situation so yeah there's diff- a lot of different opportunities that you can look for and I think this is a great time to start and do you have anything to add Mandy um yeah I agree that seeking out like Chinese education or education in any language or about different cultures um, around the world really shows your curiosity and your open-mindedness. So it's a good idea to try and be, um, what's it called? Be more proactive in seeking out opportunities to pursue your interests in Chinese or whatever other cultures or languages that you want to learn about. Um, Because colleges do really like to see this. And um, like uh, Annabelle, she applied to the Husband program at UPenn. Um, And each year, I believe it's only like around 50 students who get accepted or get into the program. And I think her Chinese experience really helped her um, like get in. Yeah. Yeah, I agree. That probably was like one of the biggest factors that helped me. Um, Zuo do you want to take over this slide? Okay, thank you so much for Mandy and uh, Annabelle share your experience and the college uh, inside information of your guy go through, right? Congratulations again, you know, as a teacher, as a Chinese test center, we are so proud and so appreciate you do the hard work and uh, you do the volunteer, you translate, you, uh, you did a lot for our Chinese test center. So for from uh, my point, I think this this work give you some experience and improve your Chinese and give you a future, uh, actually bright future, right? So that's the purpose for today's our webinar. And uh, we just want to uh, share with you guys, we do offer lots of lots of uh, a Chinese learning program, you know, that will be give more student opportunity to, um, to improve their Chinese learning, to get to know more about our culture. You know, this ongoing, uh, actually this year round, you know, during the winter, summer, or even the spring break, we uh, contact the top university in China, and we, uh, we let the professor, most of them then teach at the colleges and the, at the international school, their experienced teachers, they know much better help the foreign student how to improve Chinese, you know. This year we uh, have two months and about 80 hours online SHK camp. The, this registration will uh, close soon. So if you want to uh, participate with, uh, you still have a chance and also um, disseminate information to your uh, classmate, to your peers, you know, that's uh, we will start soon. That's uh, tuition free, just a registration, $50. If you are a winner, you know, uh, Miss John will draw the winner. If you win, you're gonna totally free, waive your registration fee, $50. Uh, that's a pretty good opportunity. Also, I want to let you know, if you participate in uh, this SHK program, uh, in the future, you know, when the call, when the call, oh, oops, it's ink. When the future, you know, the call is over, we can travel, you do have a first priority be selected to our camp tra- travel to China. 
to stay inside uh, inside at the university to do the camp as well. You do have a priority. That's the benefit to join today, benefit for the future. Uh, next slide, please. Okay, also another uh, program is called the Virtual Chinese Summer Camp. That is uh, uh, from the Jiangsu Normal University. Uh, this is a one month summer camp. That's a more create for the younger one, you know, let them know the cultures and uh, uh, not as that focus on SHK. This is for focus on the cultures and, and the language for fun, you know. This one much better for the Chinese beginner, you know, when they are uh, just to start Chinese learning, that will be great. Um, this two, two camp, the virtual Chinese camp will start uh, from June and SHK started at the end of June, early of the July. So this time uh, we are separated, give them more opportunity for the uh, hard learner. Yeah, if you do have any questions about this camp detail, you know, feel free to email or call me. Yeah, that's it. Okay. Now, um, oh. uh, sorry, before we start the Q&A session, I was wondering if we could um, have everybody turn on your uh, video, if we can take a camera, I mean, picture of, everyone who is here today. Can麻烦大家打開自己的視頻嗎? 我們想要有一個小小的紀念,我們想要造一個像. Mandy,請你先 stop sharing. 這樣我們可以給大家拍個照。大家好,我稍等一下呢,我會把那個音頻打開,所以大家也可以自己問我們的組長學生問題好了,因為大家都很安靜,沒有太多的問題。好,那麼我就一二三囉。<笑><笑> 一二三,smile,one,two,three,smile. Sorry, one, two, three, smile. 好,再一次,对不起,不好意思, one more time. 一,二,三,smile. 好,谢谢大家,来,我把大家的,你现在,把大家可以,mute自己,稍等一下. Should I answer the question about the AP classes? Yes, 可以吗? 可不可以, 请, uh, 安娜, okay. So on for AP classes, you can take them at your school if they offer them, but if they don't, you can use FLVS or like other, if you're in Florida, or other online programs should have them. And you can do both. You can do a high school class or you can do like a self-study. Like for AP Chinese, I self-studied for that one because my school didn't offer it and it wasn't offered online either. But I took most of them through high school. And I honestly would recommend that. It's a lot easier than trying to do it yourself. But, um, and for internships, it honestly depends on what you want to intern at. So for me, this is basically my internship, but it depends. Like if you're looking for like a science internship, then maybe I know Scripps has one. A lot of my friends went to Scripps, Max, Max Planck, if you're interested in neuroscience, um, or maybe you want to do a sports internship, just contact a lot of like different agencies and ask your guidance counselor too, because they have like a list of like different internships and even like scholarships that you can apply for. And, oh, for me, how many years of Chinese did I take in high school? I took none because my school didn't offer them. So I like did a self-study. 
Yeah, me neither. My school did not offer any Chinese classes. So what I did was I took like Chinese honors on FLVS. And also um, I had like a Chinese uh, weekend, like school or like summer school. Yeah, I, used to I just that. listed yeah. that in my extracurricular. Yeah, most mostly like public schools don't usually have Chinese. They usually only have like Spanish or French if you're lucky. So don't worry if they don't have a class. You can always do it like on the side. Um, I actually teach in a private school down at Miami. Yeah. Uh, this year, I have two of my ex-students who, uh, who I taught them Chinese starting when they were second grade. Um, they were actually, uh, gr they graduated this year and one went to her, um, her dream school, which is um, University of Mississippi. And for her audition in theater program, she actually sang a song in Chinese and submitted that. And so she was able to uh, get in. And then another student who is going to, um, oh, I forgot her, I forgot the name right now. <laughs> I'll be right back. But she also got into a business program and pursuing her Chinese. Both of them are continuing and minoring in Chinese. Is it uh, Georgetown that you yes, said? Yes, Georgetown. <laughs> That's right, Georgetown. Thank you. Xie <laughs> Mendy. Yeah, so I think that um, it's a great way to go to like a good school because a lot of times your college will have a Chinese program. Um, so that's like a great start if you want to begin there or if you um, like plan to continue, that's a, a way to do it. Or like any other language. I know like colleges tend to be more like open with that. Like you can take a lot of different language courses and you can even like request sometimes if you have enough students that petition to have a language at your college, they'll have, they'll like bring a teacher in to teach that class, which is actually pretty cool. You're welcome. Um, Mindy, I also saw you guys talk about how do you, um, how, how did you talk about your experiences as a native speaker? Because I know some of us, uh, right. some of them might be a native speaker. Um, so I, English was my first language, like I said. And in first grade, my mom wanted me to learn to speak Chinese because that was her native language. So I was sent to China, um, Fuzhou, for a year and a half. And I studied in a boarding school there. Um, and that's how I learned my Chinese. But then once I came back from uh, China to the US, I forgot my English. So I had to relearn English and, and I just continued studying Chinese as well. And I don't know, I just like studying Chinese and learning about things about my culture. So, yeah. Um, if any of you have any questions, you're welcome to unmute yourself and then ask our uh, panelists. We still have a little bit of time. Oh, somebody raised their hand. You can go ahead and unmute if you want to, or you can type in the chat. Yes. My name is Kiswana. I'm from Barbados. I am very, very interested in like learning languages and stuff only because I am like obsessed with K-pop right now. But <laughs> I was watching a show on in China in China as well, like performing and stuff. And I'm very invested in just wanting to perform. And it's very difficult to do that here in Barbados. So I'm trying to branch out further and what you all were explaining just now a lot of um, qualifications you needed and stuff we, I I was going to offer that here so excuse my English is not very well I'm speaking Beijing dialect sorry about that um, but it's not really offered here in Barbados or at least I, I didn't have the opportunity to, to um to get any oh, oh gosh I'm nervous <laughs> Yes, yeah, so um, I was just wondering if you can give me like, any advice or what I have to explain to you what I was able to accomplish here in Barbados first before you can give me any advice. 
Um, I think that's a great question because a, like one of the biggest factors that a lot of kids um, like face when they're trying to pursue like a hobby or something is not having access to the resources. And even here, there's not like a, a huge Chinese population. So there's not like as many resources available, like for instance, like in LA or like in New York where there's like a bigger population. So I think that that's totally a valid um, thing to be concerned about. I think maybe you could try doing like an online Chinese learning program. There's a lot available, like even starting with something like Duolingo or if it's not Chinese or like Korean or something or watching videos or getting interested in stuff like that or maybe even like branching out into your community, starting a club with like friends that also have a similar interest in you uh, that you have is a great way to show that you are really like active and want to really try to learn this new language and new culture. Um, yeah, that's a great idea. So for example, right now I'm trying to learn Russian and there's no like Russian classes around me. So what I've been doing is like with myself, like just journaling and watching videos and doing all of these things. And I also plan to maybe take a class or two in college and Hopefully that will be right. Duolingo and Rosetta Stone are great um, ways to learn something. Do you have anything, Mandy? Um, I think if you if you really want to get into like the culture of China or like any any country or language wise, like improve, like find like if you like to listen to music, like try to find like Chinese music that you like, or if you like to play soccer like look up like um in soccer interviews in Chinese or if you like to dance then look up dancing shows in China or something that you're interested in that will pull you even more into the language um I agree with what Annabelle said just watch videos um listen mm -hmm. write um because I think a lot of times even if we don't have the resources to pursue like officially like a class or something you can still um find hobbies and do it on your own time yeah and I have a tip for you by the way so I know a lot of people say that like oh watch a show in like Chinese or something and have like the captions on in Chinese but I find like another way that is really helpful I love listening to music and especially in different languages so what I started to do with Chinese and Russian was I would like copy and paste the lyrics to a song onto a Google Doc and then like I would individually take each word that I didn't know and then in parentheses put like the the pronunciation and then I would put the meaning so when I would like listen through the song I would actively like know what word meant what because I'd listen to it over and over again so that repetition really helps you like reinforce the definition into your brain and then pretty soon you'll have like 50 new vocabularies just from learning listening to one song so that's a tip that I have for you okay if anyone have a specific question, feel free to ask. You know, some some ask the summer camp. You know, the summer camp is uh, open to actually open to the middle school and above. You know, since that's a college style of teaching, I don't know for the little one uh, they are gonna use to. You know, also we are teaching at the. American Eastern time, you know, start from 8, 8 p.m. to 10 p.m. For the little one, I don't know this one is gonna be too late for them, you know. Also our class teach from Monday to Thursday, every night, two hours. Uh, it's a pretty um, uh, immersion. During this two hours, they need to immersion program. Yeah, if your little one want to join, you want to try, okay, well, welcome. Yeah, maybe your whole family can learn together, parents and uh, children learn together. That's a family enjoy <laughs> for fun time. Yeah, maybe Miss John will draw the winner. If you're good, if you're a winner, we're gonna waive your registration fee. Yeah, if you no question, Miss John, you can move to the winner drawing. <laughs> 